All right, non-profit organizations across the country are facing financial hardship as the government slashes subsidies. In Gauteng, some organizations have said that their funds for the 2023-24 year are depleted with no indication from the Department of Social Development on whether they would receive uh, any in the new financial year. Now joining us um, on the line is MEC Mbali Shope of the Gauteng Social Development Department. MEC, thank you so much for your time. Firstly, um, there were delays in finalizing the panel of independent adjudicators. Why so? So, as you would know, that the department has embarked on investigations, and this does come out of the pronouncement that the Premier had indicated that we should do. Because our province does pay the largest amount in terms of the investment we place within NPOs. I mean, just the last financial year, 2.3 billion was set aside. And if you consider that is quite huge because it's far, it's double the size of the, what lottery gives. It's double the size of what the Western Cape gives. And all the other provinces are below 600 million. So we were also very concerned that both myself and the Premier have been getting a lot of allegations in terms of corruption that is taking place. And these have been widely reported uh, by Ground Up and so forth. And that's why it was important that we embark on this investigation. And part of the findings that were made was to really scrutinize our own internal processes. And amongst that, what the investigation has been able to point to is some of the weaknesses that are there. For example, you had officials that were signing off amounts of over a million. That you simply can't do, and it's not in line with Treasury regulations, because as everybody would know, or at least should know, that anything that is above a million has to go through a tender. But what you would find within the NPO space is that you'd have officials signing off millions. Um, and really what was amongst the things that would have given rise to some of the allegations and the, just the maladministration that would have taken place. Now, earlier we had a representative of the Epworth Children's Home, um, which has been in existence for, what, 105 years? What do you say about the closure of this home? Look, our team of social workers has been meeting with them. I'm not quite sure why Epworth, for example, would have wanted to speak about a closure and so forth when the adjudication process has been concluded and we're dealing now with the issues of SLAs. So I'm not sure why they are jumping the gun to that regard. Um, because as you know, with any application process, it is competitive. So everybody has to await an outcome. And I, I find it, I think, and this is what we would have said at the department, that we're very disappointed that they would have, instead of communicating with the department, because we have been dealing with them, they were not compliant. And our social workers were working very closely with them to make sure that they are compliant. And now that they're in a position of being compliant, instead of awaiting like all other NPOs who have really been patient to make sure because they understand that it's a process, adjudication has to take place, they rush to media in what we can only analyze as being an attempt to push um, the, and force the department to quickly deal with their matter, which is fine. But the issue is that you must understand that there's over 1,700 NPOs that have applied. So when you rush to media, you're forcing us to be and fair in that what is supposed to be a fair process where everybody has to be given an announcement at the same time and so forth and also be told, you are now are wanting to jump the line, utilizing your issue as a way to raise an alarm so that we quickly deal with you. We just think that it's not fair, um, especially for a, an organization that is over 100 years old and so forth. Of course, our democracy, as you know, is only 30 years old. But we're just saying that let's be fair. Let's understand that there are processes um, that everybody has to embark on. We don't in any way say that what the work that they're doing is not important. It certainly is, but so are the NPOs. So we really are just calling for NPOs to please be fair and understand that everybody uh, has to be treated in the same manner, and you simply can't want to jump the queue by all, raising an all, alarm all right. your rational media. Okay, let me see. We just, just for further clarity and understanding, when you say they were non-compliant, could you just give us more of an understanding of what that means? Why were they non-compliant? So in terms of the, some of the certifications that they required had come to an end and they needed to go and finalize those. So for example, every, annually, all NPOs have to get their health certificates and these are gotten from the municipality. Amongst the things that they needed to also update was their building certificates because that's what we ask for. But for, in order for them to get that, it has to come from the municipality and the municipality would have required additional information that they needed. So it's a number of documentation that they needed to have, and it's all part of their compliance, because we can't put 
vulnerable kids in a facility if we don't know that the building is compliant for them to be in. The NPO can be able to give them food and so forth. We really are making sure that we are tight on compliance because we don't want another life to city many. So it's really that, and that's what the department has been assisting EPS with, particularly with, to make sure that they get to a point where they are fully compliant. I still think that this situation, uh, in, in the case of this particular home, and as Epworth and, and others, um, is definitely worth saving, and I'm sure you would agree, MEC. What remedial measures are you putting in place to ensure that these children are fed, that the lights are on, that we are still in a position as a society to assist while uh, there is this weight um, from the government? So just to explain what you're indicating as a, as a weight from the government, remember all of them have gotten paid, right? And what we do is that in, this, in, in terms of the new financial year, they get paid within the first quarter. No NPO has ever received funding in the first week of April. And that's why we were saying that we find it very unfortunate that they would have raised an alarm on something that we could have engaged with them. For example, let me give you, when we speak about the NPO uh, Epsworth, Last year, we funded them for 95 children. They've only had a majority of 59 children, so which means they've got savings in their account, right? But in terms of the everyday running, they do have funding from the department that they still have over that can be regarded as savings. And that's why we're saying, why would they have needed to go to the extent of saying they don't have money, they want to close down and so forth, on matters where they could have just simply discussed with us, and we discussed with them how they can be able to utilize the savings in the meantime and so forth, whilst the processes of signing the new SLAs are concluded because in terms of our own schedule, we're still within time because, as I indicate, payments for NPOs annually have always taken place at the end of April and sometimes still over towards the first week of May. So what would have then necessitated this alarm to be raised, and necessarily so, when the issue is completely under uh, in control? All right. The issue seems to be the lack of certainty around whether or not they will qualify um, to be supported by the government in, in many cases of the NPOs, for instance. So let's talk about timelines, MEC. When will they know whether they qualify or not? So the processes of informing all NPOs have started now in terms of, but what we have indicated, because I, I cited earlier the investigations, we've now centralized what was a decentralized process. So which means that it's only the HOT that's going to be signing off the SLAs and not the officials and so forth as it was the case before. We further indicated in our statement that because we've had to centralize, we've also looked into what are the efficiencies that we need to bring in so that as individuals are brought in into groupings, because we certainly can't call 1,000, close to 1,800 NPOs to all come at the same time. So they are being called in in groups. But as they are coming in in groups, we've also looked into what are the efficiencies that we need to bring in that historically would have delayed the process. For example, historically would have required all board members to come in at the same time and all of them sign. So we've said because technology is available, you do have a ability for individuals to sign electronically. Let's only have the three that are critical. Your chairperson, your secretary, your treasurer. The rest can be able to sign off electronically. So it's those type of measures that we have built in to make sure that we're able to conclude our work and begin the payments as of the 31st of April. So that's why I was saying we still have sufficient time for us to do all this work that we need to do in terms of the communication, bringing them in into the various groupings, the efficiencies that we're bringing in so that we're still within our timeline. All right, MEC, thank you very much for your time. That was MEC Mbali Shope of the Gauteng Social Development Department.